Hello and welcome to the AP Legislative Preview. I am Rachel LaCourt, the AP State House Correspondent in Olympia, Washington. This is our first Zoom preview, so a little bit different from what we've done in previous years. Well, we do have a panel of lawmakers here to talk with us about the upcoming 105-day session. And then at 10 a.m., Governor Jay Inslee will speak and we'll take questions from the media. For my colleagues on the call, please keep yourselves muted. Chris Griegel, Seattle news editor, is work in tech, so he will unmute you when I call on you. Uh, there are several colleagues I already know I'm calling on to start with, but if you are in this call and would like to ask a question and have not already talked to me, please put your request in the chat and I will call on as many people as possible for the next hour. If you have any questions, you can also um, put your question in there. If you have technical difficulties, put your question in there and I will ask it for you. So to start with our panel, um, I'm gonna introduce House Speaker Lori Jenkins, Republican Senator Shelley Short, Democratic Senator Monka Dingra, and House Republican Leader J.T. Wilcox. Thank you all for joining us. I do wanna start with talking to you about our unusual session that starts next week. It's a hybrid version. Many of you will be on campus on Monday, but much of the work is gonna be done remotely. However, in light of the events that we saw yesterday, both at the US Capitol and outside the governor's mansion, I did wanna to talk to you about security concerns at, that you may have heading into the session, especially as at least one group has talked about occupying the Capitol. So I'm gonna start with you, speaker, and then if each of you could address that in the order that I introduced you. Go ahead, speaker. Uh, thank you, Rachel. It's good to be here uh, for my second uh, forum. Um, I'm, I'm eventually will be an old hat at this, I guess. Um, uh, you know, I was, I was in Olympia yesterday. Uh, I, I, my heart was broken to actually watch what was happening in the other Washington, uh, watching our democracy being attacked in that way. Um, and, uh, you know, Yesterday, when when I was when I watched the protesters uh, in Olympia, uh, for the most part, it was a peaceful protest uh, until um, uh, the breaching of the gate at the governor's mansion. One of the things that I think sets this Washington apart, one of the many things from the other Washington, uh, though, is that our executive branch and our legislative branch are working uh, hand in hand on security for Monday. I feel uh, very confident that that members will uh, be able to get into the Capitol building uh, physically safely and uh, and that their health will be protected when they uh, get into the uh, House chambers. Uh, it is my, you know, we're a country that has been uh, founded on, uh, on the right to protest. And uh, I don't, you know, I don't wanna abrogate that uh, at all, but, uh, doing, you know, engaging in illegal criminal acts is not civil disobedience, um, is not protesting. That's criminal behavior. So, um, uh, you know, I, I welcome uh, uh, people making their points um, and making them safely, both when it comes to COVID uh, and, uh, and uh, to people's physical safety. Uh, but we'll be we're, I'll be working very closely with the governor's office, with the state patrol, with his staff, and uh, making sure that Monday is a safe day for legislators to carry out their constitutional duties uh, to this democratic republic. Senator Short. Thanks so much, Rachel, and really appreciate the speaker's comments. Um, I'm confident we're going to be able to conduct session on Monday safely, um, even in the midst of peaceful protest. I, I think we need to remind ourselves that this session is going to be different than any other, and people who have normally very much engaged in the process aren't going to be allowed to do that. Um, so I think we need to remind ourselves as we go forward that we do everything we can to make sure that voices are heard. Um, you know, with that said, you know, I absolutely um, abhor what happened yesterday on, on every level. We can never condone violence. Um, we've seen violence throughout our state uh, this summer and, and throughout the country and, and what happened yesterday. And we can't condone violence in any way. Um, so I look forward to our work. I look forward to working with my colleagues. I think in this Washington, we can show there's a different way to do business. And I look forward to that. Senator Dinger. Thank you, Rachel. And, you know, I want to echo what um, 
both um, Speaker Jenkins and Senator Short have said that in this Washington, um, we do do things differently. And you heard it from my Republican colleague. Um, we are working together. We um, are making sure that people feel safe because it is important to do um, the people's work. I personally was so devastated yesterday, like so many of us were. Um, I think so many of us take pride in the fact that in our country, we have always had a peaceful transition of power. And to see what happened at our um, nation's capital was, was just devastating. And um, I feel that we're prepared here in this Washington for Monday. And this is really a time for people to come together and make sure that we are working on policies that will make everyone's lives better. There's a lot of work ahead of us and we can get there if we work together. Representative Wilcox. Thank you. Uh, well, um, yesterday was a wake up call for everybody, uh, both uh, in DC and in state capitals uh, all around the country. And uh, in Olympia, and I'm sure the governor's office is uh, having some discussions about how uh, the security at the mansion uh, was breached. It was about 50 yards from my window and uh, I could watch things happen. And uh, I will say this, um, people should not, should not be taking down gates. Uh, they were on the porch. Uh, it was a crowd that on the governor's mansion side wasn't intending violence because it would have been easy to perpetrate. And I'm very thankful for that. Uh, but uh, I see that Sarah Gensler is here and uh, she took some very harrowing video and it's not just about legislators. There's a whole bunch of things that play into this. It's about people's, people's need and right to participate in the political process and engage in legitimate observation, input, and yes, protest. Uh, and it also, we've got to recognize that the safety of the press is just as important as the safety of anybody else. And all of us legislators are in a building with a whole bunch of security. And a, a lot of you are out there uh, in places that are much higher risk. And, and I think all of us need to stand up for the press. I, I've said many times that um, I've never been mistreated uh, in uh, Washington by the press. If you're honest, and especially if you're honest about what you may have, the misstatements that you may have said, uh, the people in Washington are going to treat you fairly. Uh, I'm confident, just uh, like Lori is, and people should know this is a uh, process where we all collaborate. I, Lori and I were on the phone yesterday while all this was happening, talking about security, and I spent some time with the chief clerk of the house yesterday talking that over. Um, but it's not just the Capitol. It's the people outside the building, too, that count. Okay, we're going to move on to Q&A. I want to make sure all of my colleagues have time to get their questions in. So I'm going to start with Austin Jenkins from Public Radio. Chris, if you can unmute him if he's not already unmuted. I'm going to press you guys really hard on this. Um, you're voicing unanimous consent that you can do this safely on Monday. Uh, there are people, including an individual who was at the governor's mansion yesterday, exhorting people to come back on Monday and occupy the Capitol. You are trying to get 147 legislators safely into the Capitol, keep people who are intent on getting into the Capitol at bay, uh, with a state patrol force that yesterday couldn't protect the governor's mansion. Um, how is this not highly irresponsible and reckless, given what you know is looming to move forward with this? Why don't you all show up in some farm field and sit on your hoods and put up some bleachers and invite anybody who wants to come watch you do this vote. It's a one day deal. Why don't you ask the Supreme Court for some ruling over the weekend about maybe not meeting in person on Monday and therefore not having to do this, you know, bringing everybody down here. I mean, this seems like a train wreck about to happen. So Austin, I'll just say, I. I am concerned about Monday. Uh, you know, we've been talking about security and me especially for um, quite a few months. I will say I do have faith in our um, law enforcement officers. 
Um, I do think that they have, they are planning for this. And um, I think we have to be cautious, but I also think it is important that the state see their elected leaders do the job that they were elected to do in a safe way. We are a country that believes in law and order. We have to be able to do our business and not be intimidated and scared because people are going to show up. I do want everyone to be safe. I think having, being, having individuals injured or even die is unacceptable, but we have to be able to manage this crisis as a democracy. You know, and I, I, have, to, I have to agree with Senator Dingra. Um, you know, I, I don't fear peaceful protest. I don't fear protest. But if we allow those who want to use the words that they use um, to instill fear and intimidation, um, I think it's incumbent upon us, it's our duty um, to act. Um, we, we have, went, uh, over my time in the legislature, both in the House and Senate, we have witnessed times where you're going through throngs of people, you know, trying to make your way between committee, between votes, or maybe negotiations, or, or people shouting across, you know, uh, across the rotunda, or really while you're in chambers. We, we have allowed people to have their say in those ways and still maintain safety. And I'm confident that, that we can do that. But if we, if we kowtow to that intimidation, then they've won. And, and I think there's a stark difference between people who wanna peacefully protest their frustration at not having access to par participate in, in a normal legislative session versus those that are just using the situation um, um, to, to really, I'm sorry, bring anarchy. That's the only word I can use to describe it. Uh, you know, I'll just uh, add a little bit here. I mean. Uh, quite a loaded question you ask with a lot of adjectives, Austin. Um, but I'll, you know, uh, I think that I was uh, the way that yesterday worked in terms of, of breaching the gate at the governor's mansion was not acceptable. Um, and I uh, am, you know, I I think that there are a lot of good lessons to be learned uh, from that uh, by the state patrol and others, and I uh, expect they have been learn, but I totally support what Senator Stingra and Short uh, have said. Uh, one of the great things that we, you know, no matter how heartbroken I was to see what happened in Washington, D.C. yesterday, at 3.30 this morning, it was made clear that Joe Biden is the president, is the incoming president of the United States of America. Uh, the House and the Senate reconvened. They went through a democratic process to make that happen. And uh, while uh, our, it, our, uh, our democratic republic is fragile in a lot of ways, it is also as tough as nails. And um, it, the way that it is tough is because we come back and we, uh, the elected representatives, uh, wanna exercise their constitutional uh, uh, duties and responsibilities, and we intend to do that. And uh, we uh, intend to work with the, the governor's office uh, to make sure that we can do it safely. And also, I mean, I just never want us to forget that uh, uh, potentially the larger threat to people right now is actually a pandemic that uh, has killed uh, hundreds of thousands of, of Americans and thousands and thousands of Washingtonians. And so I think we have great plans in place to both protect people's health in that way and to protect people's physical health. Austin, um, that's a worthwhile question, but 140,000 people that we each represent uh, expect us to do our jobs. And uh, it appears that the constitution requires this meeting to be uh, in person. Um, I, for one, would love to do it out on a farm but um, this is where we're going to do it. And, um, you know, you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't run for office uh, if you're not willing to take the toughest days uh, along with the days where you get uh, a different kind of positive attention. Before I move on to Sarah Gensler, who's going to be next in line for questions, just keeping on this theme, I do want to offer up a question from Patrick Malone from the Seattle Times, who's asking, is there any plan to call for a performance audit of security at the Capitol, 
to assure that it truly is as fortified as you guys seem to be confident that it is. And you don't all have to answer that, but if just someone wants to weigh, is it anyone couldn't go look for any sort of audit of capital security? You know, I'll just say, I think we have to get through the next few weeks, uh, get through next week and then reassess where things are at. Um, I don't think any of us really thought that we would need that level of security that was called for yesterday. Um, you know, but our, our, our sense of our safety has definitely changed. And so we are going to have to take a look at different decisions now. But um, this is all new information and new ways of behaving. You know, like I said in one of my earlier questions, a lot of us, including me, were so devastated because we never thought that what happened at our national capital would happen in America, and it did. So I think there's a there are a lot of things that we will be processing and thinking about uh, and how we move forward. Okay, I'm going to move on to Sarah now um, if she has a question. Sarah Gensler from McClatchy. Um, I'm actually going to keep pressing you on this. Uh, um, a man with a gun yesterday threatened me uh, to death for doing my job. And with all due respect, I'm, I'm sure if you would have asked members of Congress yesterday morning if they thought um, they were confident security could could fend off what happened, they they likely could not have imagined what was to come. So if anything, I think the events of yesterday here in D.C. showed that we in the, in the public maybe can't can't trust that security is adequately prepared or maybe it's impossibly impossible to adequately prepare for this sort of situation. So um, following up on Austin's question, why not rethink this? Um, I mean, it may be your duty to act, but why not specifically rethink your current plan for meeting in a legislative building um, and maybe consider some of these out of the box ideas that, that Austin brought up? Uh, Sarah, I, I'm gonna start off because I wanna kind of acknowledge what you went through yesterday and um, and I'm very glad that you are safe uh, and that you are here with us today and that what you were doing yesterday is exactly what members of the House and the Senate are going to be doing Monday um, in terms of uh, protecting our Constitution, you doing so by protecting First Amendment rights, um, us by uh, making sure our representative form of government is in effect. Um, I guess I, one of the things I just need to note for folks is uh, I actually think that meeting in the uh, state capitol at this point is the safest thing that we could do. You know, the House, um, the, the House was actually uh, had looked into meeting at uh, a uh, university in uh, Thurston County, and as they started to see violence uh, uh, happen at other state capitals. Uh, they declined to host us. And then we also talked to the Olympia School District, which was very interested, uh, but they had students and teachers in all of their buildings. And they also uh, felt like it was a danger um, uh, there. So I, I actually don't think the suggestions about e meeting in an open field and things like that, I I'm, I'm assuming people are not being serious with such a suggestion. Um, uh, but I think that the state capitol is the safest place to do that. Uh, I work in the public health sector. Uh, in the public health sector, we don't actually even believe in accidents. We think that every uh, everything can be prepared for and that you work to prepare for every um, possible circumstance. And that's what we are going to do. Certainly yesterday was a wake up uh, call and uh, what happened yesterday will um, definitely be considered as we evolve the planning for Monday. Um, uh, but we are going to uh, uphold the constitutional uh, responsibilities that we all have on behalf of the voters of Washington state to make sure that we can convene and work on things like uh, uh, funding our vaccine response, funding testing, but like helping small businesses uh, uh, get uh, situated so they can we can come out of this uh, uh, huge uh, economic devastation strongly. Uh, that we can help renters, that we can uh, help all sorts of um, of folks, uh, so that we can move forward as a state. That's the that's the most important thing that we can do for the people and uh, we can do it safely. And certainly we do have to plan. And honestly, I am not going to in this, um, in, in this dialogue 
or any other be specific about what the plans are to protect legislators as they come. Senator well, Schor, I just, I, Wilcox, do you want to weigh in before we move on to Essex? I, I would like I would like to. Um, I think I think these are tremendously difficult times. Um, this whole year has been tremendously difficult on people and families throughout, you know, all of our communities. And and I agree with uh, Speaker Jenkins. You know, those those plans. I'm confident that that. What happened yesterday and the planning that's now going to take place, and I, I agree, we are safest at the Capitol. Um, they can minimize access. Um, we can do this, but but if we, and, and look, Sarah, I'm not taking away from what you felt yesterday. I cannot imagine being in your situation and that terror, and I'm glad you're safe, and I'm glad you're okay. Um, but I think if we start to bend to this, then it just gets worse. Um, I don't think it gets better if we acquiesce and and we do this in a virtual way. We have to show that we're ready to take on the business of the state, whether whether that's a full session, a, an abbreviated one, the issues, the budget. We have to show that we can do that. People need to see that. We've had a lot of chaos this year and, and the chaos that happened yesterday. Um, pe people want to know that we can get I beyond that. To some of Graham's and, remarks. Right. Right now. Uh, can we mute everyone, please? Oh. We are, yes, uh, local lawmaker reacts, and I'm logging stuff. Oh. I listen to it right now. Stuff. Some of it, yeah. Um, can everyone really please good. mute themselves if they, you are not currently asking a question? Thank you. All right, Senator Short, continue. No, I'm, I'm, I was just finishing up. Thank you. Okay. Next up is Essex Porter from Cairo. Yes, hello, and uh, let me let me ask about uh, some of the policy matters uh, you plan to get to. One of the reasons, of course, that there is so much anxiety is there's been so little COVID relief while we're asking people to shut down work, shut down their businesses. For from both uh, the Republican leaders and the Democratic leaders, what are you planning to do to add to the COVID relief? that would give people the opportunity to take the COVID safety measures to reduce the pandemic? Well, I, I guess I'll start Essex. Uh, we've been working on uh, some early um, early action uh, legislation and most of it funding related. Uh, we're, still, um, we're still making sure that we can understand in full uh, what the last federal package uh, has and provides for, but we do know some things that I can uh, that I can talk about. Uh, there will be a significant chunk of money, uh, and again, we want to do this in early action, um, uh, probably in the first two weeks to get to really get the money uh, out the door. Uh, so there's a fair amount of money uh, uh, coming from the federal package that we want to get released uh, for vaccine, uh, for, to, to distribute vaccines, for contact tracing, for testing. But then uh, there's probably going to be at least 25 million or so for food assistance. Uh, we know that rental assistance is going to be a huge issue uh, with the eviction moratorium. Uh, and so probably around 300 million, maybe 325 for rental assistance and utility assistance. Uh, we'll have some money for child care grants, um, uh, at least uh, 120 million we've identified for business assistance grants for our small, uh, small businesses uh, to help them get um, through this. And so that's, that's what we'll be doing on the funding uh, side, at least some of it. There, there will be um, more to come as we, again, understand the federal package. Um, and, you know, I think we're also very willing to tap the rainy day fund. Uh, it's the rainy day fund is for rainy days and we're in rainy days. Um, so we'll, we'll also be looking at that. And then there are some policy things that we can do. For example, um, the, you know, the, through a kind of a quirk in the way our law is written, um, businesses who got the payroll protection program funds, the PPP funds from the feds, uh, were, are required to pay a B&O tax on that. So we want to provide relief so that there's no taxes uh, on that on those PPP 
PPP, uh, of that PPP money that flowed in. And I think we can also do some work on waiving uh, property tax uh, interest fees to businesses, which are pretty high, they're 12%. Um, and so uh, doing some policy work to potentially waive those, maybe give counties also some um, additional authority to reduce property tax rates during this time for our um, business community. So there's a whole bunch of, um, of items we're looking at. We, we also need to do, just as an aside, this goes, I think, beyond your question, but we definitely need to help out our school districts on, um, on transportation and enrollment funding. That's a very complex, you probably won't see that in the first couple of weeks because it's very complicated to work that out. And we're working with uh, those partners right now to make sure that we can do that. But so that's just kind of a little, a little kind of thumbnail sketch of some of the things that I think uh, we Democrats want to do. We're working, our, our House and Senate uh, colleagues are working together quite well um, to make sure that we're prepared to move something forward quickly. Yes, thank and you I so much think for asking. Go ahead, JT. Thanks, thank Shelley. Um, you know, people forget that business time is very different from legislative time. And uh, unfortunately, this is too late for uh, a lot of businesses. In the legislature, you think you have 105 days sometimes, or you can always do it next year. Uh, every single day that goes by, people are closing down. So uh, we, we really want to join with all parties and all caucuses to move the things that are possible to move forward as quickly as possible. And uh, I've mentioned many times that we wish we would have been able to come in earlier and do these things. Uh, Representative McEwen has a suite of bills that I've talked about quite a few times that directly impact uh, the cash flow of business. And that's how businesses survive uh, when the chips are down is it's just pure cash flow. Uh, so we want to uh, enact the McEwen bills or equivalent bills from any source. This should not, we should not care at this point who gets the credit. Uh, I think another really critical uh, step that directly impacts the ability to re-employ people, because this is about people. Businesses are here to serve people, uh, and uh, a huge barrier has arisen because of, uh, you know, both uh, the reaction to COVID and uh, the fraud that has taken place uh, at ESD, and that is that uh, many, many businesses are seeing three to 500 percent increases in their uh, unemployment insurance rates, and we should use part of the rainy day fund to backfill that. Uh, this uh, this was caused uh, not by the businesses; they didn't lay people off because they wanted to, uh, and uh, it's a bar to uh, the survival of these businesses and the reemployment of people that want to get back and be productive. Okay, I'm going to move on to Melissa Santos from Crosscut. Hi there. I have some questions about the budget uh, or a question about the budget. Um, you know, uh, for the Democrats, Republicans have really said, you know, look, the budget, um, you know, that the governor proposed, for instance, is $5.5 billion above uh, the last budget the legislature passed. Um, I understand that maintenance revenues have gone or maintenance costs have gone up. But is there any way in your minds that you can um, do some of the relief measures you're talking about without raising taxes? Is that something you've given thought to? And then there are, for the Republicans, do you disagree that maintenance costs have gone up to the point where, you know, you're basically just treading water if you don't raise taxes? So um, I'll just start by saying uh, you heard, I think, both from the Democrats uh, and the Republicans today, as well as a wonderful, um, I think, um, letters that all four had written in the Seattle Times over the weekend. There is a lot of agreement that people need help. People, small businesses are struggling and suffering and have been. We have so much work to do ahead of us when we're talking about rental assistance, we're talking about small business loans, we're talking about uh, the homelessness issue, the eviction uh, moratorium being lifted. We haven't even started talking about behavior health. We haven't even started talking about a foster um, uh, care situation that was already struggling. Um, and we have police accountability issues to deal with. All of those cost money. And, you know, we can write pretty words on a piece of paper and pass them. But if you really want to help people, you have to put the dollars behind those words. Otherwise, they're just, it's just a novel. 
And so if we are serious about helping people, those dollars have to be made available. You know, I've, I've said this a few times and I heard this from someone who testified in the Law and Justice Committee. And she said that 2020 has actually given us perfect vision. It has clearly shown us the inequities that exist in our society, all the way from housing, access to education, access to healthcare. And we as elected leaders of the state now have that responsibility to address those inequities. And, and you know, I'm very mindful of the fact that I represent the most affluent legislative district in the state. And I have seen firsthand the difference in the uh, haves and the have nots. And it is so stark in our state. And so if we're serious about really helping people and doing right by them, we have to make sure we're addressing all of these inequities. So, Melissa, the Senator Short, thank you for the question. Actually, you know, caseloads, uh, we, we showed this year that actually caseloads have gone down and in part um, due to the pandemic um, and our ability to have a different, you know, budget situation than what we thought we were going to have in June. But, but actually, as we go forward, we're still expecting revenue growth to come into the state of Washington. It may not be as high as we have had in future years. But we still have a duty, you know, as legislators to set budget priorities. Um, look, we are learning a lot about the needs and the things that we have before us. But the last thing we should be doing is raising taxes on our family owned businesses and our job creators in the state of Washington. I think when Essex really pointed out to people feeling chaotic, they're feeling desperate. You know, how it, it's not just a, a person's health, it's their economic health too. And if we continue to take money away from our job creators to do this, we're, we're just creating a worse situation. How are people going to get back to work? You know, how are we going to allow a recovery to happen where, where people can get out and work? I'm confident that we can start these things, but look, all of these things are not going to be fixed in a single year, and, and there are certainly challenges that, that we will be taking on. But, but if we are truly going to be honest about this, we, we need to, to look at the things we need to do, look at the budget, look at the revenue. Um, you know, to, it, it seems from year to year, as long as I've been in the legislature, there's never enough money to do the things that the legislature wants, but we need to be mindful about who pays that bill. And, and I think when you think of UI, UI taxes, payroll taxes, the different things that are coming to the forefront of our job creators and our family owned businesses, then it is incumbent upon us to not make it worse as, as we try to do the business of the state. Okay, we have several people left in the queue still. So moving on to Laurel Demkovich from the Spokesman Review. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so as we've already said, this legislative session is going to be unlike any other, and I think it's kind of anticipated that there's likely not going to be as much legislation that's able to be discussed and passed this year. So how are you balancing that with all of these issues you've already talked about that you're hoping to take on? And what exactly are each of you and your parties prioritizing in the next 105 days? Laurel, this is the Senator Short. Welcome to the Spokesman Review. Um, and Jim, we're going to miss you. Appreciate your years of service that you've given um, in the Spokane region and in Olympia in your service. Um, I just, I just have to say, um, you know, I've had my own priorities, but I, I realize that this year is tremendously different, and we need to look to the needs of the greater community, of our family-owned businesses, of our job creators, of, of people who are still going to need assistance to get through this time. And I, I think our priorities are that. It's, it's dealing with the unemployment insurance, the rates that are going to come. It's getting our kids back to school safely and, and getting the, va just as the speaker has said, getting the vaccines distributed, continuing to do our work, protecting the most vulnerable you know, long-term care, um, making sure that those are the most vulnerable to COVID, um, can, that, that we give, you know, enhanced uh, work and relief and protection to, because that, that is really what we need to do as a more targeted approach than, than the broad brush that we have continued to do this year. So I look forward to this session and I look forward to getting to know you. So welcome aboard. 
So I'll just say, you know, economic recovery is going to be front and center. And um, this interim in the Senate, we had a special committee on economic um, recovery, and uh, we heard from experts all over the, uh, the country, because we have Zoom now, um, on, on what it takes for our state to really recover. So that is going to be the main focus. And I'll, and I'll tell you, uh, the consensus really from a lot of those experts were that we can start talking about economic recovery when we get COVID under control. So those go hand in hand. And, um, and while we're talking about economic recovery, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the inequities in our societies has to be dealt with because we have to come out of this, um, this pandemic and uh, out of um, the challenges we're having with our economy right now in a way that does not leave people behind. And we have seen that over and over again, that um, that we have, frankly, I'll be frank, uh, the people of color in our state are suffering uh, at a rate that is disproportionate. And so absolutely, economic recovery, making sure we're addressing public health, but doing it in a way that does not leave people behind and is fixing many of the problems that have uh, really been brought to light last year. Your Jenkins uh, or Representative Wilcox, do you have comments quickly? Well, well, I'll, uh, I'll just say m most of you have probably seen the memo that uh, my leadership team put out to our caucus. Um, one, asking members to limit the number of bills that they filed, but also outlining um, our, uh, our priorities for session. First, we asked members to screen all of their legislation uh, with two questions. Is it urgent and is it important? Um, and and to, for that to be their first test. But then we're, we're also focused, I think, on four categories. Um, one is COVID response and others have talked about that, but I just wanna note for a lot of people, they think that's just health related. Uh, but in fact, our COVID response is a whole ecosystem unto itself um, in terms of, we know that people will not really engage in all sorts of business activities, all sorts of things, unless they feel safe to go out in community and do that. So we obviously have to focus on the health end of that, but we also know if we wanna reopen businesses, for example, that the workforce needs to have their kids back in school, we need to have childcare available, things like that. So that's a very large area that we are going to be focusing on. Uh, second is economic recovery, and, and we've heard about that um, already from uh, uh, Senator Dingra and Senator Short, um, but that's going to be a focus area. Um, the uh, equity, and I think a lot of our police accountability work will go there, but I'll make another comment about that in a minute. And uh, the, our, the existential threat of climate change will uh, be a kind of the four areas that we really try to focus on as House Democrats. I would also just say that we made a commitment a number of months ago and have been working with the Senate uh, on this. And I think we're, we're very aligned to use an equity lens in our, um, especially a racial equity lens in our budget making, our budget writing decisions, as well as our policy decisions. Uh, for too long, uh, we, things that we've built into legislation that we passed hasn't had this equity lens and it has disproportionate effect on people. And we wanna make sure that we're not continuing that in 2021. So those will be some of our focus areas. Well, this is a hard question to go last on uh, because uh, <laughs> common problems. And so we sometimes have common solutions, but the post COVID economy, of course we're Republicans. Uh, we think about the economy all the time. Uh, and I uh, appreciate all the things that have been said. Uh, I am very aware, and I think my colleagues are, uh, about the fact that uh, in many cases, uh, people of color are left behind in our economy, and many, many of these people that are people of color and left behind uh, are represented by Republicans. Uh, and uh, our members in central Washington, like Alex Ibarra, Chris Corey, Matt Benke, they are steeped in economic recovery. And uh, we have to remember, uh, as, as I've brought up many, many times, that if, if we're gonna lift all people, uh, we have to be very sure that we are lifting the non-urban uh, parts of the state and the small cities and small towns. And so many times we do things that may build the economy of the state of Washington in aggregate, uh, but we leave these people and places behind. And uh, I know that uh, I've had a lot of talks with Alex Ibarra about this. Uh, he's determined to be a voice. 
uh, for those. And so we have uh, a way of looking at equity that maybe is not exactly the same as everybody else, but I think it will serve people uh, well in many, many cases. I, one other thing that I want to throw out there too, um, you know, when you're in the minority, you think about process a lot more because if process is done well and if it's designed well, it, it protects the political minority. Uh, and I've learned a lot uh, being in a political minority for 10 years. And one thing that I think is going to be important to both the Republican caucuses, and I think people in the majority caucuses as well, is uh, we've now stress tested uh, the emergency powers of the state. And uh, clearly, the governor has to have emergency powers because things happen. But at the same time, uh, we would like to see uh, adjustments so that the legislature is involved uh, and it cannot go on in an indefinite way without having the involvement of uh, all of the representatives of the people. So that's going to be a priority as well. Before we move on to Drew, Drew Mickelson from King, I do want to read a question from Hannah Scott on Cairo, who is having Cairo Radio, who's having some mic issues. Her question is for Senator Dingra and Representative Wilcox. She wants to know where you both stand on police accountability proposals, including decertification, independent investigations, and collective bargaining reform with police unions. Um, thank you uh, so much for that question. It is something that I have spent a lot of uh, last year working on. Um, I will say that um, we have been coordinating a lot between the Senate and the House on uh, the police accountability bills. Um, you know, we've been working with stakeholders, community members, law enforcement. Um, all stakeholders have been uh, at the table trying to figure out how we move forward. And there's some great ideas. I have reached out to my Republican counterparts, uh, asking them to help support these bills uh, multiple times as well. And so there are some bills that have already been uh, pre-filed. Uh, we have the big tactic bill from uh, Representative Johnson. We have had, uh, we, uh, Senator Pearson has filed his um, police accountability bill that deals with the decertification process. Uh, I, along with Representative Lovick and Representative uh, Ramos have also uh, pre-filed a slew of three bills. There will be a independent investigation bill uh, dropping soon in the next uh, couple of weeks, hopefully. And um, so, you know, these are things that have to be addressed. They have to be dealt with. And uh, I'm confident that we will make um, headway in, uh, in a lot of these issues. And I'm happy to go into as much detail as people want to get into on these bills. Representative Wilcox. Well, this is one of those places where I think in the past we've had some pretty amazing uh, collaboration. Over the last uh, few years, you saw the follow-up to I-940 uh, and some pretty moving speeches uh, on the House floor from uh, the chairman of the committee, Representative Goodman, and uh, the ranking member, uh, someone who is a law enforcement officer, uh, Representative Clipper, and they agreed <laughs> tearfully in a couple of cases. Because the, these are moving things and you learn so much as you start to understand how differently we can perceive the way that uh, law enforcement works. And so uh, we have designed our, our um, public safety committee in a way to be as collaborative as possible. Uh, at the same time, uh, I've had a lot of law enforcement officers in my caucus uh, and uh, I have found the ones that I know to be really, really amazingly sincere public servants. And uh, their input is extremely important to us as well as the people that they're supposed to keep safe and the people that have been victimized when things have gone wrong. Uh, so I, I have not uh, gone into great detail in this policy now because I've found in my life in the legislature that the hearing process uh, is among the most educational things that can happen. And I'm looking forward to extensive hearings in this. I understand that they're gonna happen early. And I think for those that pay attention, every single one of us is going to learn things that we didn't know uh, about the experience that other people have. And I've been blessed, uh, honestly, by a, by a three hour conversation one time with Nate Miles, who a lot of you know, who told me what it was like for him as a black man growing up in the South in the 60s. Uh, not something that I would have learned growing up on the farm in Roy. 
so we've all got something to learn. I, I am very hopeful that collaboration is going to be productive, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm not ready to say that uh, I've got a position on bills that have been dropped now because they may very well change, and I hope they will based on input of many. Okay, moving on to Drew Mickelson from King. Drew, you're still muted. How about now? You're good now, thanks. Good morning, all. I, I did have a quick follow-up just for, for Representative Jenkins, and I'll get to my other question, but uh, Representative Wilcox brought up the emergency powers concerns. Uh, what do you feel about that? Uh, would you like to see the legislature have been more involved in the, in the past in the past year? I'm hoping that's a quick follow up for you. Um, uh, Drew, I'm very comfortable with the governor's executive powers. I think that the big weakness of the legislature is that a uh, number of years ago we didn't we started not adopting joint rules that allowed. Uh, 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 that would have allowed us to call ourselves into special session. And the biggest check that we could ever have on governor's executive powers, uh, if we want to take other action, is, um, is to call ourselves into special session. Uh, the, one of the things that's on our agenda for opening day of legislative session is to adopt joint rules for this two-year biennium so that we can do that. And I think that's, that's what the responsibility of the legislature is, is if we uh, don't uh, believe the governor is, exec is, uh, is exercising executive powers in an emergency situation, uh, then we should call ourselves into special session to do that. I also just do want to note that um, contrary to so what some folks think, there actually has been quite a bit of engagement with uh, all four corners of the legislature. The governor has issued uh, dozens of proclamations through this. Any proclamation that he has issued, which uh, which alters uh, statutory requirements, uh, can only last for 30 days, and it can only be extended by the four corners of the legislature, the, all four, the minority and the majority parties in both houses, uh, agreeing to extend them. We've extended them numerous, numerous times. There have been some uh, that we have negotiated with the governor's office on, especially the Republicans have made some points of, of uh, proclamations that they would like changed. And that has happened. And there have been uh, some that uh, that we haven't gotten four corner agreement on and they haven't been extended. For example, last week, uh, the uh, Republican leaders dis declined to uh, extend the proclamation that waived a one-week waiting period for people to file for unemployment. Um, and so that's something that we will need to deal with very early on in the, in the legislative process so we can make sure people can access unemployment but uh, insurance. But uh, so we have had, uh, I think, a lot of interaction uh, through that. And so there, there, I think there are good uh, processes in place and uh, once we adopt our joint rules, you know, should we not be in session, um, uh, we will be able to call ourselves into special session if there's something that we think uh, the legislature should be doing. Hey, Drew. Drew, I'm, like I'm uh, Senator, go oh, okay, go ahead, JT. No, no, Shelley. Well, I just, I just have to re respectfully disagree. Um, number one, we could have called ourselves into special session. I look forward to the joint rules to, but we could have indeed done that and we're actually attempting to do that. And while I agree with the speaker in terms of the proclamations that we have the authority to actually review and decide whether to continue or not, um, the biggest ones, the things that have impacted everyone in the state of Washington and the governor's unilateral you know, authority of the stay home, shut down orders, the, the edicts that have come from him and him alone, we have not been a part of that process. He has refused to allow us to be a part of that process. And, and that is the thing that we need to change. We are all duly elected to represent our constituents and people in the state of Washington. And we have been left out of that. And we could have we could have taken care of that this year and should have. So, so that is the importance of bringing forward the legislation to change that. Yeah, and, and I'd like to respond just a little bit to, um, you know, I said a little bit earlier, the governor needs to have the power to respond to emergencies, but it shouldn't have no limit. Uh, at this time, it's defined as the extent of the emergency until the emergency ends. And it doesn't say, you know, when that happens. We don't know when that happens yet. Um, 
you know, these most of his emergency powers are established by law passed by the legislature going back to the 80s. So it absolutely uh, has been within the, the purview of the legislature to talk about emergency powers uh, and it should be in the future. So I, I hope that that's not off the table. And uh, I, actually, yesterday was the first day that I had heard about the, the joint rules uh, challenge. Uh, it never has been called into session by just the legislature. I hope that we can uh, make that easier to do in the future, but that doesn't mean that we can't talk about these legislatively established uh, rules for emergencies. Okay, and we're moving on to what may be our final question from Brett Sihan from Fox. Yeah, I was just going to ask about the process of uh, working remotely. I mean, as, as many of my fellow colleagues know, um, it's not always easy. What contingency plans do you have in place? And um, what different things are you work, working with to make this session go as smooth as possible? You know, I can uh, take that. Um, we have been practicing um, and trying to implement um, procedures for months now. Um, actually, just yesterday, we had, I think, the second or third um, practice um, with senators. And yesterday was one where all of us were on uh, the practice together on the floor. And so we've been seeing improvements in uh, on the floor activity for sure. And they're going to be hiccups. And I think this is where we have to make sure that everyone is being very patient. Um, we have um, changed. Um, we will be making changes to our rules to make sure that, um, you know, as, as the majority party, that we're limiting the number of surprises. And I'll just say, you know, the Senate Democrat uh, have been in the minority. Uh, we got into the majority three years ago. So there's a lot of memory on what that felt like and making sure that we are working collaboratively, that we are giving um, notice of bills, that we are um, really doing a much better job working together in getting policies passed. And I'll just say, you know, I think Senator Short and uh, Senator Elias just um, work so well together on making sure the floor moves the manner um, in which it should. And, and I am very optimistic that with the two of them, that that will continue to happen. In terms of our committee hearings, um, so many of us have had uh, so many committee hearings already in a remote session. What I have found fascinating, and this is, I think, an unexpected consequence is we're hearing from more people from all over the state than ever before. People who were not able to drive to Olympia because of maybe job responsibilities, of childcare issues or transportation issues, they're making their voices heard. And to me, that is fantastic to see. Uh, we're not limited to geographic areas anymore. And so I am looking forward to really robust conversations and testimonies during committee. I think we will have a challenge because I am, I think hundreds of people are going to sign up uh, to testify. And that is something uh, our committee chairs will have to deal with. But I think there is a great opportunity for people to get involved in a legislative process. And we have asked our entire state to change the manner in which they do their business. And it's going to be our turn to make those same changes. And I think we are all rising to the occasion, but I'm sure there will be hiccups. Brett, this is Senator Short. I, I just, I, I do echo that we are trying really diligently to work together to create um, opportunity for notice and, and those things. I think yesterday there were quite a few hiccups uh, in in our virtual session, but what I can tell you is that my job, and I think the job of Senator Elias is to make sure that, that people's voices are heard. And so as we have those hiccups, as we go forward on the floor and if things are happening, I'm hoping that we can continue to devise ways to make sure that people aren't left out of the process. Um, so it's gonna, it's gonna be a challenging session for sure. I have a quick question for the speaker. Last year when we did this preview, homelessness was the top issue for the legislature for that last session before COVID hit. But if anything, that issue has only gotten worse over the past year. So are, is there any plan by the majority to address that um, as part of your work this session? 
Yeah, I mean, I think uh, one of the challenges we have, Rachel, is uh, not just homelessness as it exists right now, but the threat of homelessness as a result of, uh, you know, luckily we have an eviction moratorium right now, but then what happens with all these renters when the eviction moratorium is gone? Uh, and when we talk about, uh, we, we actually, uh, we, Strom Peterson, we formed a committee that, uh, particularly focuses on uh, housing. Strom Peterson is chairing that for us. And uh, uh, Nicole Macri has been working on a number of uh, housing and homelessness issues, uh, as has our capital budget chair, Steve Theringer. So we have a team that is uh, working on the uh, issue. But I would say when you start to think about our budget, uh, everything that we have done on homelessness in the operating budget is part of the most discretionary part of our budget. And so when you think about uh, uh, us being in a deficit position as we move into the next biennial budget, this is why we have to talk about revenue um, uh, if we're going to actually uh, really make advancements um, on housing and homelessness. I just will for a minute uh, also talk about um, uh, the, uh, the house plans um, I think we've uh, we've worked very well uh, together. I, we'll, I'll see what JT has to say, but I think we've worked well together mm -hmm. collaboratively to try and design a process in the House uh, to move legislation um, forward. And I just it's 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 really important to me that I know that. Listen, I would rather we're all there in person. That's what I would like. I would like a session that is no different than any other session we've had. Um, but, um, and just like everyone in this state would like their life to return to exactly what it was before this, or for the most part, what it was before this. But um, there is no point in having members in Olympia and risking illness or death uh, and shutting down a legislative session and preventing us from actually being able to do the work of the people. Uh, when you look across the nation, we've had uh, 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 at least seven or eight uh, legislators uh, die as a result of COVID after convening a number of other illnesses. So we wanna make sure that we can move forward, but I'm, I will never, uh, argue to people that this session is going to be a series of unicorns and rainbows. Uh, it's going to be challenging. We're going to have glitches and um, we are going to move more slowly and we're going to have to be patient with each other and the public is going to have to be patient with us as we try to move through this. But we're practicing, we're working hard uh, to try and make sure that we're accountable and transparent and, uh, and that's, uh, that's how we're uh, trying to work forward. And in our final three minutes before Governor Jay Inslee speaks, Melissa Santos has a very short question for Senator Short. So um, that's how we will be ending this panel. So Melissa, go ahead. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Senator Short, you talked about not making things worse as being a priority during this pandemic. Is, is not raising money to spend um, on new programs possibly making it worse by not providing relief? And what, what programs would you cut to make to, if you weren't going to raise revenue to pay for COVID-19 relief? So I think, Melissa, those are discussions we need to have as a legislative body, and we will. But, but when you start raising taxes on our job creators and our family-owned businesses, people lose jobs. I've seen it in my own community with my own Main Street businesses. We, we have people who have had to make those decisions. Look, it's not an either or, we're gonna do both. But what I would suggest is that we need to continue to prioritize and the fastest way we can get people back on their feet is to get them their jobs back. And so I feel like the making it worse, if you start this tax and span part, it's gonna come from somewhere. And, it, and it's gonna come from the very people that we're hoping are gonna are gonna give people their jobs back and and get people back to work, have robust manufacturing in the state, um, you know, good family wage jobs. So it's not an either or; it's both. But but we have to have that discussion, and we will this session. All right. With that, thank you all so much for joining us. And we are now going to switch over to Governor Jay Inslee, who, who I believe is on the call. Thank Governor, you. are you there? Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We might be having some technical difficulties right now. Yes, I see the governor, but uh, let's see if we can get him on video.
Oh, Governor Inslee, can you hear us? Right, so I'm going to try to contact the governor's office here. Just one second. We're just going to take about a three minute break here while we try to sort things out with the governor's office. Good morning, Governor Inslee. Thank you for Good joining morning. us today. Yes, uh, thank you. After you're done with your comments, we will open up the uh, conversation to Q&A from the media who are assembled via Zoom. So go ahead and, and start if you will. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, yes, just give me a moment here to use new technologies, if you will. Um, uh, first off, in our comments today, obviously, we are prepared for our legislative session. I'm very excited about it. I think it has every reason to believe it's going to be a very productive session. I'm, I really am excited about opportunities to, to move uh, progress forward in the state of Washington, undiminished by the fact that we have recent challenges. I really do believe that Washington is a state that just keeps the arc of the moral universe moving forward. And I believe we will be able to do that yet again, undeterred by our current challenges with the pandemic and otherwise. So I'm looking forward to a really very productive legislative session. Uh, before I talk about that, though, obviously, we do need to make some comments about the events of the last couple of days. Uh, first off, I want to thank the profession, the, the professionals who have been reporting the incidents, including uh, some members of the the press yesterday who were, I'm told, threatened by some of the uh, the insurrectionists. And that's uh, unfortunate. I want to thank the profession for showing diligence to report the news, even in difficult situations. And we, have, we continue to be appreciative of that. So um, let me make some comments about what happened uh, in the nation's capital yesterday. It is certainly a horrendous event. Uh, the last time this happened was uh, when the British, you know, uh, attacked. And to see the Confederate flag in the U.S. Capitol would, is, is so uh, 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 horrendous that beyond um, imagination, uh, it was not a protest. It was an insurrection. And we need to go to the heart of that insurrection and remove that cancer. And that means the President of the United States who has continually fueled this insurrection with his uh, outright uh, deceptions, his uh, deceit, and his continued lies. And it is very clear where the fuel for this has been. It has been the President of the United States who has continued to try to convince every chance he gets that this election was stolen when in fact it was won. 
This election was won by Joseph Biden and lost by Donald Trump. And the violence that we saw yesterday, it had a clear cause, and that was the deception of Donald Trump. And I do not believe the United States can abide that clear and present danger even for another 13 days. He needs to step down. He needs to be removed if that's through the 25th Amendment or impeachment. But by any legal means necessary, we cannot abide the, the, the current risk to the security and the freedoms and the democratic traditions of the United States. And I would commend those members of the US Congress who are trying to move in that direction. I also want to encourage the Republican party to do some serious soul searching this morning. It is time uh, for Republican leaders to stop pandering to the falsehoods of the president. Now, this is much more about one uh, expired presidency. Everyone has a role in, in fighting back against this, this lie. And it is a, a, a dark lie, and it's the heart of this violence. The people who are on uh, our lawn uh, yelling stop the steal have been convinced of this by a deceptive president. And while it's a nice gesture for some of the Republican leaderships to say they're against this violence, that's appreciated. But they need to do much more than that. They need to strike against the dark heart of the deception that is causing this tumult, turmoil, and actual loss of life. And that's this concept that we didn't have an election. We had an election that 60 judges have already ruled on, numerous secretaries of state, the U.S. Supreme Court. And those are the organs of democracy that we have to rely upon. Uh, and I know some Republicans have done that. Our Secretary of State, Kim Wyman, has stood up against this lie. Um, I was very impressed with Senator Mitt Romney yesterday. And to me, he captured the most uh, salient comment uh, when, when people were trying to aid this insurrection on the floor of the Senate yesterday, and they said they're just trying to help their constituents. And they're just trying to show respect to their constituents. What he said was the, the way to show respect to citizens is to tell them the truth. And we need some truth tailors from the Republican Party to, to remove this platform of deceit in the United States. This is a clear and present danger to democracy. Uh, we saw Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler in our state uh, refuse to join this attempted coup, and that's what it was and still is ongoing. Uh, when she refused to sign this uh, absolute insane uh, effort to get the, the Supreme Court to deny the will of the voters. So we're looking forward to more leadership from the Republican Party. They need to make a decision whether they are the party of Trump and deception or the party of democracy, and they need to do that today. And I hope that they will rise uh, to the occasion. Nonetheless, I'm confident that we will start the session. It will be productive. Uh, we will have measures in place so that the legislature can, uh, can do their jobs starting next week. So moving on to discussion of the session. Uh, last month, I laid out my priorities for the session with our budget, and that uh, included immediately taking action uh, for $200 million more in aid for small businesses and for landlords and tenants. And my priorities uh, also included getting more children back into the classroom in a very safe manner, both for students and educators. Uh, it means that we need to continue to improve our public health care system and our mental health care system. Uh, it means that we need to continue our progress in fighting uh, climate change and quite a number of other priorities. Uh, I will be uh, talking to legislators actually this afternoon about the need for early action in this regard. Uh, the needs of our citizens are so acute that we need the legislature to take some early action to be able to distribute uh, help to a variety of Washingtonians so we don't have to wait till the final budget is concluded. Uh, I think there's good reason to believe we can accomplish that uh, to some degree. Uh, because people are hurting. And that includes businesses that have had to be shut down to certain other services because of the pandemic. And we all, we all understand how tough that is on people. 
So I am hopeful that the legislature can act in, in maybe even the first week uh, in this regard. Uh, I do believe our priorities are consistent with Washington values and, the, and rising to the challenges that we face. Uh, our agenda is basically focused on three things, relief, recovery, and resilience. Uh, it's relief for the here and now of the people in need. It's a recovery plan to turn the uh, corner and a resilience plan for our long-term economic growth. All important, all are uh, uh, reflected in our budget. I think we are in a good position relative good position, even in these tar uh, tough times, to do these things because we have demonstrated in Washington the unique uh, innovative spirit, uh, the uh, following science, the willingness to abide by uh, community laws, and all of those things have saved thousands of lives in the state of Washington from the ravages of this pandemic. Uh, after getting hit early in the pandemic, uh, we have consistently been in the top five states of keeping this pandemic at lower numbers of fatalities. That means 45 other states have had a, a more difficult time restraining this pandemic. And that translates to literally to thousands of lives saved. If you compare us to some other states, to similar size, they may have had five, six, seven thousand 7,000 more deaths than we have. And this, this should give us confidence in our ability uh, because we have followed science, because we've acted together, because we've used our heads, um, that we are in a good place going forward relative to the nature of this challenge. Now, the reason these lives have been saved is in part because of our state's emergency power statute, which has allowed our state to be successful in this regard. And uh, these things we have demonstrated the efficacy of masks, we demonstrated the efficacy of social distancing, and now we uh, are looking forward to the uh, deployment of our vaccine. Um, so we know more help is needed uh, for people right now because people have such needs for critical needs are not being met. met. We need more assistance uh, uh, to folks who've lost their jobs. And although much has come to the, from the federal government, I can tell you today I am more optimistic because of the results in Georgia about the chances of Congress finally being able to rise to the challenge. But people need relief now. We need uh, to get people back in a safe environment and we need to keep people from losing their housing to get more uh, and get more who are currently homeless under a safe roof. And that is why we will talk to legislators about early, an early action agenda. Now, we have led the country in so many different ways. We are legitimately proud of our state in so many ways that we've led in the, having the best economy in, in the country before the pandemic, uh, have been uh, listed as the best place to live, having the best paid family medical leave, the highest minimum wage. We've led the country in so many different ways. But there is one area where we actually uh, are in the worst condition in the state of Washington, and that is the fairness of our tax system. Our tax system, frankly, is a scandalous uh, situation because it rewards the wealthiest and puts the demands to finance need, the needs of Washingtonians on those who can uh, meet that need the least, uh, the lower income workers of the state of Washington. And the pandemic has made that inequity uh, much clearer uh, as the concentration at the very top has been accelerated. While Main Street has suffered and more families wonder what they can uh, do to afford food, the concentration of wealth has increased. So that's why we are once again calling for a, uh, a capital gains tax, one that would impact less than 2% of Washingtonians. And at the same time, uh, we intend to lower unemployment insurance taxes for small businesses relative to what they would have been and that unexpectedly has laid off record numbers of employees. And uh, we also want to do this to help working the working poor by finally financing uh, the working families tax credit. So what we're doing is to propose to make our system fairer 
and at the same time help those most in need in our state. So what we're proposing is not just to go back to what you might think of as normal because we're not ever satisfied with the status quo in Washington. Uh, we need to be better than normal coming out of this pandemic. And it goes beyond COVID. We can't just uh, address economic disparities without recognizing racial disparities. Uh, last year further exposed the fissures between uh, the lived experience of white Americans, black Americans, and other people of color. N not only in criminal justice, but in health and education and other parts of life that many of us take for granted. And uh, we think of one another as equal because of one of the nation's principles, but we can't uh, just have rhetorical equality. We've got to embrace that throughout our our systems of policy. So my legislative agenda takes aim at these inequities in all of these areas, whether it's reforming independent investigations involving police violence, uh, it, whether it's uh, making sure we have environmental justice as we fight climate change and other uh, environmental challenges, whether it's improving our healthcare systems, expanding job training and expanding early child education. This is an opportunity for the state of Washington to move the arc of the moral universe forward in all these measures. So that's just kind of a brief summary of some of our priorities. And obviously I'm looking forward uh, to more of your questions. Uh, before I go, I wanna say that uh, our state is having a great loss, uh, which is Jim Candon going on to another adventure. And uh, we wanna thank him for his decades of service to our state. You've heard me say this, but I really mean it. Having a professional uh, media is so imperative, particularly to fight back against the deception that's going on in our new uh, communication world. And Jim's professionalism has been uh, top notch for many, many years. And we appreciate his service and look forward to whatever his future is. I do wanna also say, and this goes, this goes as to unfinished business, I do want to remind Jim of in 1996, when I was running for governor of the great state of Washington and the spokesman review uh, denied me an opportunity to have an ed board because they didn't believe my candidacy uh, was sufficient enough to have that honor. And, uh, you know, that's been something, of course, I've tried to forget, uh, but I, it's been very difficult but now that I'm a third term governor and Jim is going off to his reward, uh, Jim, you and the spokesman review are fully forgiven. I understand your motivation and uh, I wish you well. So with that, uh, I'd like to stand for your questions. So I just wanna remind my colleagues, if you wanna ask a question during this portion, please let me know in the chat and I will try to get to everyone. I can't promise that I will. Um, Governor, I do want to start by asking you, though, if you are considering activating the National Guard to bolster security at the Capitol in advance of opening days of session next week. Uh, well, we are committed to having uh, security so that legislators can function. We know that the threat level has increased uh, dramatically. We know, and I do believe we have to look at this as people who are interested in insurrection, not just freedom of speech. And there is a difference, obviously when you when you uh, uh, attack the United States Capitol, it's not protest, it's insurrection. And we have to be prepared for that. So we are uh, actively planning on that. I'll actually have some discussions this afternoon, uh, both with the State Patrol uh, and with the National Guard to determine uh, what measures are necessary. We have not made final decisions about that. So we will provide a secure environment and our highest hopes is that nobody's injured in these situations. And I hope we'll be able to uh, accomplish that. And I do want Jim Camden to be able to participate in one last AP legislative preview. So I'm going to throw the next question to him and then move on to Keith Eldridge. Uh, Jim, go ahead. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, thank you, Governor, um, for the kind words. Uh, I'm not going completely away, so you may see me occasionally again. But um, the legislators are talking about uh, uh, changing the, the governor's emergency powers and, and possibly making it easier to call themselves into a special session in, in the case of, a, of an extended emergency. 
Uh, what do you think about their plans, and, and are you going are, uh, are you going to oppose them? Well, I haven't seen what the proposals are to date, so I really can't comment on them. Uh, I have to say, with all of the discussion of this, there was never anywhere approaching any critical mass at any threshold that where there was actually consensus of of, of having a special session and, and changing the emergency powers. So that never has arisen actually uh, in our state. And the reason I think it has not is that is because of the uh, documented, scientifically verified fact that the decisions we've made as a state have been so successful. And I think one of the most important things in this discussion is for all of us to ask ourselves in the first part of this discussion as to whether what we're doing is working. And this is a place uh, where uh, it is clear that it has had success. The emergency decisions we have made clearly have reduced the death rate. Our fatality rate in our state, and I believe this is relevant to this discussion, that's why I'm sharing it with you, is less than half of it is uh, essentially of the average in the United States. And so I think if legislators actually look at this situation and find out that we're in better shape than 45 other states, and once that information is disseminated, which it may not have been disseminated to date, uh, the, the, the conclusion will continue that what we're doing is, is on the right course. So I doubt actually that that's going to uh, have movement in the legislature. But of course, I'm always interested in critiques, which I listen to on a daily basis to try to refine what we're doing. We've made multiple alterations to our plans, in part because legislators have brought suggestions to us. We do that on a daily or hourly basis. So there has been a vigorous effort to receive uh, suggestions and critiques of what we have done. And I think it's been very successful because that has helped us. The criticisms we've received from legislators have been uh, listened to and acted on uh, with some frequency, and that has helped improve the process. So I think that the most important part of this debate is a question of whether what we're doing is working or not. And the evidence of that is quite clear. So when that evidence becomes clear, I, I think that we will maintain the course uh, that we are on in the state of Washington and not seek failure that has been so fatal where other states have not taken some of the measures that we have taken. We are not going to stand idly by and allow more people to die in the state of Washington. So um, that's what I think on that subject. Okay, moving on to Keith Eldridge. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations to Jim. We're going to miss you, but we'll see you around in some fashion. Uh, Governor, in light of what happened yesterday at the Capitol of uh, D.C. and what happened on your front lawn, uh, did you say that you were going to be calling out the National Guard to augment the state patrol when things get going on Monday? And is there any consideration of asking the legislature to get uh, permission to uh, have a virtual session and so that people aren't in the building? Uh, no, we have not made the decision on the National Guard. As I indicated, uh, I'll have a meeting with uh, Chief Batiste and General Doggerty later this afternoon to talk a little further about those security issues. So we have not made that decision yet. It's possible depending on what the threat level assessment is. So we'll, we'll know more in the next couple of days about that subject, but there will be security. We do understand the threat level is high given what happened in the nation's capital and at, at the governor's residence uh, yesterday. Um, uh, your other question is about a virtual session. My understanding, and I could be wrong on this, you need to ask legislators is that they need to have at least one in-person activity uh, to start the session to adopt the rules for virtual sessions. That is my understanding. So uh, I believe this will be able to be accomplished. And again, I, you know, I think one of the reasons I hope that we should have confidence that we will have more legislators who will speak to their constituents and tell them, look, this election was not stolen. Donald Trump is telling you a big, bold, nasty, inappropriate, national scale, dangerous lie. And you don't need to come to the Capitol because it wasn't stolen. And the more legislators who talk to their constituents in that frank term, the less problems they're going to have having a legislative session. Now, we've seen a little bit of that from the Republican Party, but we need to see a lot more of it 
to quell this unrest. Look, if people did believe this election was stolen, you could understand their, their angst. It's just that it isn't so. And that's been confirmed by so many different courts. So anyway, I'm hopeful that we'll have more help uh, in that regard. Okay, next question is from Drew Mickelson with King. Governor, on the on the same topic of what happened yesterday on, on your front lawn, was that a failure in security? And what can be done to make sure that doesn't happen again? And should those folks, the 100 plus people who broke through that gate, face trespassing charges, be prosecuted? Well, I've talked to the chief briefly about this. I know they're going to look at see if they can improve some intelligence to be able to respond to these things in a faster measure. And, and I'll let you talk to him in the future about that as that review goes on. But I know they are going to review their procedures to see if it can provide more safety for everyone. And safety is important, not just to the governor or the state patrol, it's important to the citizens as well. We're happy that apparently there were no injuries yesterday. That's, you know, top priority. Uh, so that's good news as far as we can take it. But there will be a review of this to see what improvements can be made. And I think there will be uh, improvements. I do want to, again, as we talk about these security issues, the, the, the most important thing to do to prevent that type of violence, though, is for, for Donald Trump uh, to be removed from a place where he can foment this activity. And he is fomenting it. We need to place the blame where it belongs for this activity. And it's for the person who is lying to the American people saying this election was stolen. That's where the ultimate responsibility for this lies. And we should not forget that. Uh, and, and, and he's been accommodated by too many of his fellow party members who have sold their souls to a person who's willing to lie to the American people about the most fundamental aspect of this, which has never happened in American history before. So let's not take the shining light of responsibility uh, where it really lies. Next question is from Essex Porter with Cairo. Yes, Governor. Um, when the breach of the mansion grounds happened yesterday, were you at the mansion? Was the first lady there? Uh, what fears did you have for your safety when that happened? Uh, I was at the residence and uh, I felt that there was uh, good security uh, at the building. And I'm glad everything worked out. And nobody was injured. And um, I hope people will realize that that did not have a beneficial impact for anybody. Uh, it's not going to interrupt the functioning of the legislature, ultimately. It's not going to intimidate me. Uh, it's not going to change how I look at these issues. So it really didn't have any benefit to anyone. And I really encourage people to uh, let democracy work here. It's going to work. And the less that people engage in that intolerance and, and actual insurrection, uh, the better democracy is going to work. And I encourage them to listen to the courts and the Republican Secretary of State of Washington, rather than a people, the person who has been deceiving them for years now. If they will do that, the democracy will be on an even keel. And I believe that it will be. I do believe we will get through this. I do believe democracy will survive. It's had maybe had a narrow miss in the last few days, but I believe it will. Now, it'll be more likely to survive if the, the Congress will act to prevent the president from doing any more damage by any legal means that is appropriate. But I believe that we will get through this ultimately. Thank you. Next question is from Sarah Gensler with McClatchy. Governor, it sounds like the early action agenda you mentioned will include more than the 200 million that you've uh, previously detailed. Could you please provide more details on what you'll be proposing in terms of dollar amount and where that could be directed? Uh, yeah, well, I, I'm, what I've been able to share with you is what we know today, and uh, and we're we are developing the proposal we'll make to the legislators. Uh, I'm talking to some of the legislative leaders this afternoon about that. So I really don't have too much detail to add to you right now. But the most fundamental message I can share with you is that we do need early action of some dimension, some considerable dimension, given the needs of our folks. Look, we've got restaurants that are uh, either closed or not doing indoor dining. Uh, they need assistance. We have renters and landlords who are hurting because uh, 
of the pandemic has necessitated eviction moratoriums, which is the appropriate decision, but we know that causes challenges. We need uh, to uh, improve our health care to folks who are in need. There are many, many needs we, we have. So I, I will be able to share with, more, with you more next week, I'm sure. Governor, speaking of that eviction moratorium that you've extended through the end of March, it, it's not rent forgiveness. So a lot of those people are going to have a, a looming <clears> bill <throat> that lifts. Um, and the independent landlords right now who may be struggling because of the decrease in their rental income. Can you talk about specifics on what you want to see the legislature to do to address those two specific issues? Well, we've been talking to legislators about uh, potential statutory changes to the current system to put parameters on repayment plans. And there are several ideas that are being floated on how to do that, what processes to use, it's fair to everybody, uh, to have rational, fair repayment provisions. And uh, those ideas are still being <clears throat> refined and percolated, but I think we do need to uh, make sure that we don't allow this to cause massive unemployment at some point uh, when we still, when we get through the pandemic or massive uh, uh, um, homelessness, excuse me. And so uh, we're still looking at several of those ideas. I'm open to a number of them. I think it probably does need some statutory action. Next question goes to Austin Jenkins from Public Radio. Governor, you have repudiated the president today and in the weeks and months preceding today. Um, you, at the same time, come under criticism from some of the very people who stormed the gates at your residence yesterday who say that you're acting in a tyrann tyr 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 tyrannical fashion. Um, and you also make kind of an ends justify the means argument about the steps the state has <laughs> taken. But don't you invite some of this discontent and violence and mob action by acting unilaterally, by, by not calling the legislature into special session, by exerting these emergency powers for so long, even though you have the right to do that, it can create a climate where people feel like it's too much power for one person to have. H how do you address that? What responsibility do you have here to what's going on, at least in this state? Well, I can assure you, Austin, having been here yesterday, uh, no one was chanting special, special, special session, special session. That is not what they were upset about. They were upset because they've been convinced by a serial narcissistic prevaricator who has been lying to them to effective uh, dissemination because up till now, Twitter and Facebook has allowed his fountain of deception to continue about sealing the election. That's what they were mad about. And this had nothing to do with special session or otherwise. Now, the emergency powers we have, I don't believe in ends uh, justifying the means. The means were all legal. They were under the emergency grant by the statutes of the state of Washington. They have now been confirmed by every court that has been challenged. There's been dozens of challenges against this. And, they, and all the courts have something in common. They have confirmed that what we have done has been pursuant to the law. And this is one of the things that there's a central uh, uh, underlying tenor here of this discussion we've been having as a society. Donald Trump decides anything that's bad for him is against the law. That's not the way it works. We have a system to decide whether I acted as a, a, a tyrannical power or whether I acted under the laws of the state of Washington in a way to save lives. Every single court that has asked that question has come down saying that I acted within the authority of the governor uh, and has not challenged it. And so we have a way of resolving the question you asked. And the way we resolve that in a democracy is we have the courts answer that question. It's more important that the courts answer your question than I do or the people out on our lawn. We have the courts to answer that question. They have given you the answer to that question, Austin. And the answer is no, I have acted within the grant, not just of power, but of, but of responsibility. And to not have acted would not have been responsible. I also note that I'm not alone in the United States. I think almost every governor in the United States has taken some emergency power that is necessary 
in this regard. I will also note that uh, you are right that some of my Republican critics, uh, you know, have said they wanted to get in and do some things that would have injured people. And I stood against that. I'm damn glad I did. Because what they wanted to do to go in that would have reduced our ability to save people from homelessness and additional lack of mental health and educational budgets. I look, I took some cuts myself. I did that by myself to the tune of almost a half a billion dollars by my action alone. But they wanted to do some things that would have been very harmful to Washingtonians and turned out not to be necessary. Uh, they <clears throat> were making an assumption that we would have had a lot less revenues that we've ended up having. So had I yielded to those forces, and allowed them to cut services to Washingtonians, when we didn't have to do that, that would have been a mistake. And the events have proven that. Uh, my decisions have been vindicated in that regard. Now, you're not always right. Things don't always turn out. History can show you you made a decision that didn't work out. In this case, uh, my position has been, I believe, fully vindicated by events where we now have had additional revenues and the cuts they were insisting on, uh, you know, would have been unnecessary. Now, let's go back to the fundamental issue about whether, and here's the question. Um, well, let me preface the situation. I understand deeply, personally, and daily the suffering people have had economically, in part because some of our emergency orders. Uh, I think daily about the restaurant owners who might have lost their dreams, in part, if we can't help them enough to survive this pandemic. And that's why I've been so dedicated to helping them. That's why I've already provided $100 million to businesses. And now I'm calling for the legislature to take early action to help them even more. It's because I understand the terrible suffering people have had economically as a result of this pandemic and the things we've had to do. But we have made a decision in our state, and that is to save lives. And let me make this very clear, and it's hard to say this, but it is a fundamental truth. Now, the Republicans who wanted to not take these measures, more people would have died in the state of Washington. Probably thousands of people would have died in the state of Washington if we had listened to the folks who were with Donald Trump on this subject, who has been a titanic failure that exposed us to hundreds of thousands of deaths nationally. And I was not going to allow that to happen. And I'm glad we've made those decisions, painful as they are. We are not going to allow thousands of more people die in the state of Washington. Not on my watch. So that's a fundamental decision we've made. And I believe they're the ones that stand for the most precious thing, which is life. And I've stood for that. Next question is from Melissa Santos with Crosscut. Hello, Governor. Um, given that the Democrats look like they'll have control of the U.S. Senate or marginal control, are you expecting more federal stimulus money? Are you expecting more federal stimulus money to come now in some new package that might aid the, your budget and the state budget going forward? I can't make predictions or assumptions or expectations at this moment. You just can't. And, you know, uh, it's a good thing that the, the leadership in the Senate has changed. But the Senate has a thing called the filibuster, which can basically stymie all human progress. It's one of the reasons I've been against the filibuster for quite some period of time. And that remains a potent tool to prevent states from having additional assistance. And Mitch McConnell uh, has been uh, very willing to use that tool to stymie helping states. And he has shown very little to zero empathy for the conditions of states. In fact, early in this, he said, well, states can just go bankrupt. Well, he has that attitude in the filibuster. We just can't count on uh, additional assistance. So I do not believe it would make sense to uh, have that assumption going into the legislative session. Next question is from Joseph Claypool with WNPA. 
Hi, uh, thank you for your guys' time. Um, in response to the events that occurred in DC um, in the past couple of days, is there any concern about a possible double standard amongst uh, police and or security response to, to those events um, relative to similar scenarios that have played out around the Capitol building in the past? Yes, this is troubling. It's troubling to me to see the response to in the nation's capital to the Black Lives Matter relative to the uh, mostly white insurrectionists. That is very troubling to me. I can't explain it from what I know to date. Now, maybe there's some intelligence that I'm not aware of that suggested this was not going to be a problem in the Capitol, but that sure was not the, the view that I had from sitting here. And so it is very troubling to me. Uh, and I and we're going to need a thorough understanding of what happened here. Um, so the answer to your question, I am very bothered by this. We need to get answers. And it is very troublesome to many, many people this morning, including myself. I'm going to go to Austin Jenkins, who has a follow up for you, Governor. Um, well, Governor, I mean, the, the question about disproportionate or, or, or unequal response is rel relevant here, too. There were no arrests yesterday after a mob stormed your residence or the perimeter of your residence. Um, the, I saw a Twitter video that was posted of a state patrol, I believe, riot team that was in front of your residence during a Black Lives Matter protest several months ago. The, as far as I could tell from the video yesterday, there was a lone trooper at the gate yesterday before that group entered. Um, why no arrests? Why were the riot police not called out for the group that was nearby yesterday in advance of anything happening? Uh, I've asked to get answers to those questions. Those are very legitimate questions are the ones I've asked this morning of Chief Batiste. And we're gonna have to get answers to those questions. Um, and, you know, I'm disappointed in this situation. We're gonna find out why it happened and how it happened. I don't know how it happened at the moment. We're gonna get the answers to those to those questions. Um, I do wanna say I wanted to, we did have one cadet at the gate who did his yeoman's duty though, very difficult circumstances, I appreciate that. As far as why there is no arrest, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, this was a criminal activity by these uh, uh, insurrectionists. Uh, that to me is clear. The reason why there were no arrests on, at that moment may be because the forces did not believe that they had a, the, enough troops to carry out arrests because every arrest takes you know five or six officers to perpetuate the arrest. They may not have concluded they had the forces necessary to do that. But I don't know that yet. We're gonna have, we're gonna have to get those, uh, those answers. Governor, I did want to ask you a question I asked the lawmakers during that panel about homelessness. It was a top issue last year. I imagine it's still a top issue this year, considering um, that it, the issue has gotten worse due to the ongoing COVID pandemic. Are there any particular measures that you're wanting to see the legislature take up this year related to that? Well, yes. Uh, on homelessness, we want to continue our, our efforts which every year we have increased our efforts in the hundreds of millions of dollars of homelessness, but obviously we have not solved this problem. Uh, we need to continue to make uh, very extensive additional investments in a variety of things, including in our capital budget. Uh, I do believe we need uh, a very aggressive capital budget, including to, to have additional housing, including uh, a housing first programs to get people housed in part so that the, we can also deal with the mental health and chemical addiction problems that bedevils many of these folks, not all, but many. So the capital budget will be a, a fertile ground to be able to provide resources. We also need to uh, continue to improve our mental health services to people. As you know, we are fundamentally reforming our delivery system uh, so that we can treat people where they live and have more effective mental health. We've also got to improve access to chemical addiction programs, which we know are, uh, are, are bedevils many of these people. Now, I do want to make clear, though, not everyone who is homeless has a, a mental health or chemical addiction program. That is a myth. Many, many, many people are economically homeless who are perfectly cognitive and have no chemical addiction program, but just rents have gone up more than their wages. So we have to have more uh, affordable housing. We have to have better wages, which we're working on too. 
um, and uh, and do all the things necessary on a multiple front. So I think if you look at our budget, we have proposed things on all of those fronts to continue this effort. This is a last call to my colleagues and the reporting interns this year. If you have any questions, just go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask it now before we let the governor make his closing remarks. Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, from WMPA, Governor, uh, you mentioned earlier that these people uh, don't believe that there was an actual fraud in the election was stolen. I just want to make sure, was I miss, uh, sp speak, or did you misspeak, or do you not believe that these people think that this election was stolen? Well, I've been governor for eight years, you know, and I've never misspoken once. So I, I would hate to admit that. But <laughs> what I've intended to say is that these folks who are committing violence and violating the law Many of them actually believe that the election was stolen from the titanic, wonderful boy genius Donald Trump. They believe that. Now, I find that incredible, given the fact that every single judge who's looked at this, who are both appointed by Republicans and Democrats and the U.S. Supreme Court and multiple secretaries in state, including the courageous secretary of state in Georgia, who was threatened by the president and he stood up against that. And you had a Republican Secretary of State standing up against that intimidation and illegal behavior by Donald Trump. With all of that evidence, you have to ask yourself, how could people believe that this was a stolen election? It's stunning to me, but the reason is, is because they have swallowed this swill from one demagogue who has captured their minds through Twitter and Facebook of people who don't read anything else except his channel of deception. And it is terrifying to me that that's the case, but it's clear that it is the case. Now, Donald Trump has been enabled by many, if not most, well, most Republican leaders who've been, who've refused to stand up against this and call him out. They have not shown courage yet in that regard. They've shown a little bit more this morning now that their own hides were in danger in Congress, finally. So welcome to the Democratic Party, but not enough. And so that is a reality we have to face. It is such a threat to democracy that we have to find a way to uh, seek a little more understanding of the actual truth. Last night I said that what we need is to hope to seek people to find the better angels of their nature to hope that Republican leaders can find the courage that resigns in them now to finally break this hallucinatory cult-like uh, activities of this president. And the more of them that do that, the better chance we'll have of, of having a fair chance of debate and find common cause. And I'm encouraging them to do that. And I am castigating those who, who will not because it's injurious, it's caused literally an insurrection. There was a Confederate flag in the U.S. Capitol. The U.S. Capitol building has not been penetrated since the British burned down Washington, D.C. That can't stand. And we need uh, leaders to show a little gumption here. Any Thank final you. questions from the crowd? This is Brett from uh, Q13 Fox here in Seattle. Just a procedural question for our end. When do you expect to meet with the National Guard and the troopers? And uh, do you have any estimated timeline from when that decision on bringing in the National Guard will be made? Uh, we're meeting uh, later this afternoon on this subject. We may have decisions um, by this evening in that regard. But whether the guard is or is not involved, we're, you know, we're going to be committed to adequate security. We understand the nature of the threat. It is significant. And I can assure you there will be a very significant security around the Capitol for everybody's benefit, including the citizens who, who have a, a gripe and are listening to the lies of Donald Trump. We care about their safety as well. So uh, we want to have adequate security to protect everyone and not let violence to occur and allow democracy to function. We will not allow the interruption of democracy as allowed as occurred in the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. yesterday. That will not happen. I can assure you.
So we're going to get our job done in the legislature and try to keep everybody as safe as possible. Any final comments, Governor? No, again, I want to thank everyone who is up in their game in these very uh, trying times that we have. Certainly in my lifetime, I've never seen our nation stressed like it is, except perhaps during the Vietnam War. And I hope we're invested with confidence that we will get through this because people of good faith will rise to defend the truth and democracy. And uh, I want to thank everyone who's who's rising to that challenge, including members of the press who have been absolutely integral to be able to share uh, information with citizens. And I want to thank you for that. I want to thank the folks who uh, personally have done their best. You know, uh, some of the state troopers yesterday personally doing their best. They didn't have adequate resources, but individually, people in EPU and otherwise have, have done their best. I, I thank them for that. And with that, I look forward to a great session and a great, great debate in the Democratic Citadel in the state of Washington. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this first Zoom AP legislative preview. Hopefully next year we'll be able to do this in person again with donuts from Tacoma provided by AP photographer Ted Warren. So thank <laughs> you all and uh, see you next year. Please be well. Take care.